Say you've been using GPT 3.5 for a while when suddenly it crosses your mind. Should I cough up the $20 and upgrade to GPT 4? What would I actually get out of that? Well, in this video, we're going to break that down in as much detail as possible. I'm Richard, and this is Richard on Data. So a lot of you started using, or at least heard about, ChatGPT back when it first took the world by storm in November of 2022. Well, as of the time that I'm making this video, most of you are probably still using GPT 3.5 as opposed to the GPT 4 upgrade. And I don't need to tell you all how awesome ChatGPT is. Right at your fingertips, you can do things like getting ideas on how to solve problems, writing SQL queries, making travel itineraries, writing novel Seinfeld episodes about dating apps. Of course, ChatGPT has always had limitations, and it's been fairly transparent about that, and some of them are addressed somewhat in the GPT-4 upgrade. So in this video, I'm going to go in-depth to explore the differences between these two as much as I can. I'm going to show specific prompts and the responses that are generated by both GPT-3.5 and 4, so we can compare the two. I'll go over exactly what's changed and what the new capabilities are going into GPT-4, and then we're going to conclude with my opinion of who should or maybe shouldn't upgrade to GPT-4. As one disclaimer, I'm not paid by or affiliated with OpenAI at all. I don't get any kickbacks no matter what you do, I just want you to make the best choice for you. Now having said that, if you'd like to support this channel, the best thing that you could do is subscribe, and if you could also take just a fraction of a second to smash the like button, that's appreciated as well for the YouTube algorithm. So let's start with exactly what's changed with GPT-4. First of all, GPT-4 is trained on a much larger and more complex data set than GPT-3.5 was, and with a lot more parameters. It also has a much larger context window. Specifically, GPT-3.5 had a word limit of 4,096 words, and GPT-4 has a limit of 25,000 words. And it can perform better on professional and academic benchmarks, whether that's something more semantic in nature, like legal bar exams, or things like STEM-style problem solving. So there are a few implications of all of this. One of the biggest limitations that LLMs face today is they really struggle with the nuances of human emotion, as well as providing answers with contextual relevance. We're still nowhere near solving that problem completely, but GPT-4 is definitely a step in the right direction. For starters, you can give it a lot more to work with in 25,000 words compared to just 4,096. And there are some drawbacks to this increased complexity too, namely as far as speed is concerned. I will say it makes sense because GPT-4 is just trained over so much more content, but I have personally found, while it is still quick, GPT-4 has been noticeably slower than GPT-3.5 for me. But then arguably the most noticeable and important upgrade to GPT-4 is that it allows you to upload files directly. So you have the ability to pass in things like Word or PDF documents and have it summarize them for you. And also, gone are the days of, let's say you're working on a data problem and you need coding help. Previously, you might have to describe what your data looks like or pass in a dictionary. You don't have to do that anymore. You can just directly pass a CSV or Excel spreadsheet in. And that's especially useful if you're using it in something like Python by using an API key. But anyway, I've been talking a big game about GPT-4 for a while now, so let's actually see it in use and make some comparisons to GPT-3.5. So I'm going to start with the file upload with a real example. And so I'm using one of the tables from the publicly available Mimic 3 dataset. Now, for those of you who aren't familiar with it, it's a data set that can be somewhat messy. It takes a little bit of time to get used to it. And I'm going to ask ChatGPT to provide a summary or data dictionary of it and just tell me anything that I need to be aware of as I work with it. Now, I have to caveat this again and say this was pretty slow as I loaded it in, but the quality of the response does more than make up for it. First of all, it goes in and gives me a completely reasonable looking data dictionary. I remember back in the day, I'd have to go in and spend a day or several days making stuff like this. So it makes the waiting time here look like no big deal at all. And then even better, at the end, 
GPT-4 literally offers to provide a quick overview or specific statistics from the data. And me, being equal parts lazy and also intellectually curious, of course I'm going to take it up on that offer. Go ahead, ChatGPT, please provide me a brief overview with statistics. And so, interestingly, when we go to do this, ChatGPT starts by trying to load the data and then runs into an error. If we go in and look at this, it's basically hitting a syntax error trying to load the data. But then it figures it out, it corrects itself, and it starts giving me info. First thing, we've got the equivalent of a panda's shape telling me the number of rows and columns. It keeps going and telling me how many rows are missing and non-missing for these features. And then at the end, gives me really nice observations. Namely, the data set is full of missing data. The units of measurement can be sort of all over the place. And some of the data is just bad. That's indicated by the presence of these warning and error columns. And also that we probably need to be careful given the big data size. So this is awesome, and honestly, good luck getting something this good out of GPT-3.5. Next, we're going to directly compare the responses from GPT-3.5 versus 4. And I'm going to ask a more creative question. I'm telling GPT-3.5 all the parameters of my YouTube channel. I'm telling it that I have nearly 25,000 subscribers and what kind of content I generally produce. Then tell it, give me some content ideas. And then I pass the exact same prompt to GPT-4. We can now compare these two side by side. Now, first of all, there's naturally going to be a lot of overlap here. For instance, both of them tell me to see how data science is applied in finance or healthcare or marketing. But then this one is pretty interesting. GPT-3.5 tells me to review and compare popular data science tools. But GPT-4 gives me literal specific ideas like TensorFlow versus PyTorch, or Pandas versus Dask. Then here's another example. GPT 3.5 tells me to break down complex statistical concepts. GPT 4, without me even having to prompt engineer here, gives me excellent and very specific ideas. Bayesian methods, survival analysis, reinforcement learning. So overall, for this question, I think GPT-4 just gave me much better, more specific, and more useful stuff to work with here. So in that example, I was pretty unspecific with my prompt. Let's get a little bit more detailed when we go to prompt this thing. This time, I'm asking both GPTs about a real-world problem I'm trying to solve at work right now. I very briefly described what the endpoints and features I have look like. Namely, I'm using shift metrics and I want to understand nurse retention. I then tell it at the end some things that are active considerations for us. Specifically, day shifts versus night shifts are different. Also, new graduate versus experienced nurses are different. And volume correlates with a ton of these things. So if I have a relatively clean modeling data set already, what exactly should I do? And I wrap this up by telling it, it's nice if we have good predictive performance, but it's not the highest priority. Our highest priority here is actually inference. Now, in my opinion, the type of response you get from GPT 3.5 versus 4 here is not even comparable. GPT 3.5 tells us to do EDA, to do feature engineering with some examples. It tells me to divide my data into segments and analyze each segment separately, which is sort of vague. It then goes in order. Do statistical modeling, machine learning models, time series analysis, and survival analysis. But then it tells me to do all that and finishes by telling me just prioritize models that are interpretable. GPT-4, on the other hand, gives me specific features that I can create out of my data based on what I've told it. It gives me some clustering ideas. It gives me specific mixed effect ideas. Then it remembers that context earlier that predictive performance isn't the most important thing, but it says, let's maybe use these specific methods. So overall, it's giving me essentially the ways I approached the problem myself before asking this of it, but notice that it understood the context I provided far better than GPT 3.5, and I do feel slightly more like I was working with a real advisor who can give me actual relevant guidance for my problems. 
So now you've seen some examples of GPT-4 firsthand and how it compares to GPT-3.5. And I hope I have created the impression that it is a pretty significant upgrade. Then again, many of you have been using GPT-3.5 for quite some time already, so we're right back to the original question of who exactly should upgrade. So ultimately what we're talking about here is $20 a month, and that's even assuming that your company won't pay for it, because most of them will. But ultimately, you have to ask yourself the question, are you already burning that amount of money or more on something that's of lesser value? Because $20 a month is less than a Netflix subscription or most one-time meals out. So this is something that only you can answer and that you have to be really honest with yourself about. I also completely understand that not everybody can just throw $20 at everything, so let's be a little bit more specific here. First of all, if you're somebody who works in data science or software development and you already use ChatGPT daily to help you with coding, this one is kind of a no-brainer because the code that you're going to get back from GPT-4 is going to be significantly better and it's going to save you a ton of time, maybe even make you more money in the long run. And likewise, if you're somebody like me who's a content creator or you're in business and you use ChatGPT to help you creatively, this is one of those cases where just with the increased contextual understanding and creativity that GPT-4 can produce, you should be able to reap the benefits of it and make your $20 a month back easily. And likewise, if you're in an industry where mistakes might fly under the radar, but the ramifications of them are quite extreme, so let's say you're using it to help with a profession like legal or medicine, that's another case where it's sort of a no-brainer. In fact, by that point, you almost can't afford not to upgrade. But then if none of the above apply to you, maybe you're just a casual user who sometimes you'll use it to help you write a SQL query or make a daily schedule and you're just using it like a few times a week or so, it's probably going to be slightly less ROI for you. Then I'm going to end with one possible concern. So coding requires mental muscles. And if you're not actively strengthening those muscles all the time, they are going to weaken. And so as these LLMs get stronger, the temptation just grows to just rely on them rather than exercising a little bit more power of your own brain to write the code yourself. So don't get me wrong, there are certainly times and places for that. But the more you rely on LLMs for things like this, the more you're sort of nurturing a dependence on them and it's going to weaken your innate coding abilities over time. So it's just something to consider and think about. That's a risk you have to assess for yourself and be very honest with yourself about, but just speaking personally, as you've seen from this video, I've upgraded to GPT-4, I love it, and I have absolutely no plans of going back, but that's me. So thanks for watching this video. If you enjoyed it, smash the like button, and leave me a comment down below and let me know what you think. Have you used GPT-4 yet? If so, what do you think? Was it a big upgrade? Were you disappointed by it? Let me know in the comments. Then I'll see you all in the not-so-distant future. Until then, Richard on Data.